I tried to make this tutorial kind of as concise and condensed as I could. I'm going to break it down in the description on timestamps as far as the build process, the paper mache process, and the following processes be painting and the molds and the finishing and that kind of stuff. So I hope that helps you better able to just kind of go to what you're interested in. If you stick around and you watch the entire thing, thank you. Um, you are determined because this is a long one, longer than my normal videos by far. So, but this was a big project, but I really like it and I hope you do too. Okay, here we go. So this is where it's going. I have this big, huge area to cover up. So first I drew it on Procreate on my iPad. I love that program. And I colored it and trying to get a feel for how it's gonna look. Then I transferred it over into another program that I have where I'm able to scale it to the size that I need so then I can print that. That gave me my pattern to be able to cut it out of a piece of cardboard. Well, first I draw it on there. I'm a real big fan of cardboard patterns. I make them for pretty much all my projects. It works really well and you can keep them. They're, they're pretty sturdy. So I cut it all out and this is just, I'm just using a cheap little dollar store um, retractable knife here and it works really good. It's all you need. You don't need anything big and fancy. So this piece of styrofoam is something that I rescued from the shed. It was, I don't know what we bought it for, I don't know how long we've had it, but it has this foil covering on it that I, I probably didn't need to take it off, but I felt like I did. So I peeled it all off, it was on both sides, and then that gave me just the styrofoam to work with. It was actually kind of fun peeling that off. So now I'm tracing out my pattern onto the styrofoam and then I'm just going to cut it out with that same blade. So like I said, I don't know what kind of styrofoam this is, but it was a dream to cut out. It was like cutting butter. Really, really easy to work with. Um, no issues at all. I really liked it. So now I went back to my pattern and all of that shaded spot, that's going to be lower it's going to be an actual void in the skull so I'm cutting that out now and I'm just kind of carving it this skinny um, box cutter blade or exacto knife whatever you want to call it actually curves and bends so it it's, was kind of nice and I just used the end of it to grind away to get the shape that I wanted now this part was a little bit trickier and I did lose some of the detail um, in my end project, but I think it works out okay. It, I think it turned out fine. And this is all, I have no idea what I'm doing guys. I'm just, I have an idea in my head and I'm just trying to get it out there. So I know the skull is not flat, so I have to find a way to give it dimension and to try to make it look sort of realistic. So that's what I'm doing here. So I'm just carving out all those little bits and pieces that I don't need. It made a big mess. Boy, did I make a mess. So this is a Hereford skull that my daughter brought home from the ranch she's working at. And this guy is gonna give me an idea on how to create the dimension in this skull. See, like mine's super flat over there, but I was thinking I was gonna to have to build up on this top part quite a bit, and I'm not. I'm just gonna build that up with paper clay, I think. That's my plan right now. But I am going to cut out another piece to go on the bottom. So that'll just give a little bit of lift and it'll allow for the horns to come out um, a little bit better so that they're not just flat against the wall. So that's where I'm at with this baby now. OK, 
Okay, so my secondary piece is cut and now I'm ready to glue the two pieces together. So I'm just using normal wood glue. It's probably maybe not the best thing to use, but it's what I have on hand, so I use it for everything. And then I did say that I was going to build this part up with paper clay, but then I thought, why bother with all the paper clay when I have all of this styrofoam scrap here? So I just kind of sort of carved out some pieces and added them in and it helped. So now I'm going to work on the horns and the same process. I have my pattern out of cardboard and I'm just cutting out the chunks of this styrofoam. I really wish I would have had a piece of styrofoam that was long enough to do the horn full length, but I didn't. So I had to do it in chunks. And I didn't have enough, so I had to go dig up this. This is like a pale blue colored styrofoam. It was also buried in the shed. Um, this stuff was brutal to cut, you guys. Um, it's more dense and it's a different kind of cellular composition, I guess. But it was really, really hard to cut. Like you couldn't notice I have the big knife out. That's just to cut this blue styrofoam. I don't know what, what was going on with that, but. So I'm trying to get my thicknesses and I'm just, just trying as I go, trying to get the, the shape right and to get everything built up where I need it. I realized that I actually wanted the horns, the tips of the horns to kind of curve forward a little bit. So I had to, get that extra piece to glue on the tip. That's why it looks so weird. But, and then I just clamp that down so that the glue would dry. Back to the skull. This guy needs some shape. So I have Mr. Herford back there as a visual guide for me. And I'm just going to cut and cut and cut and just carve and create the shape that I want to create. It wasn't too bad, but it's actually kind of harder than you think it would be to, to get that shape. Um, There's lots of times where I would cut stuff off and I'm thinking, well, I kind of needed that there, but it's just it's just styrofoam and it's it was an experiment. So I just kept going and I it, nothing was permanent. This part was really hard, like inside um, the jaw like between the lower jaw and the upper part, that was really, really hard to carve in there with the knife. So I kept like ignoring it and then going back. So now I'm trying to line up the horns. Now this is where I had to come up with a little bit of a spacer so that the horns are actually not flat against the wall when it's hanging up there. I want them to be like away from the wall and kind of curving out. So it took a lot of a lot of cutting and this was the hard part. This is where the band-aid came in. I don't have that on on video but this is the one and only band-aid I needed throughout this whole process was slicing this blue styrofoam that was so brutal. I actually ran my free hand into the blade that's what happens. And I was struggling with this. I didn't let it sit long enough, so it kept wanting to slide apart. The glue was still, it took longer to set up um, the styrofoam than it does wood. So it kept falling apart and I was being stubborn and just wanted to carve it because I wanted to see what it was gonna look like. So I was trudging through. Eventually I put it all together and taped it all together so that it would stay and I set it overnight and then it was fine. But these were a challenge. These were harder than the skull. And still looking at them now, all finished, I would have reshaped some spots a little bit differently. Um, but maybe the next one. Like that part right there where I'm taping now, that's a little bit thick. And I should have thinned that out a bit. Another another tip is to try to get, if you're going to be carving something like this out of styrofoam, get it as smooth as you can at that cutting stage. Because it's a lot harder to smooth that out after you've uh, put paper mache or something on top of it. See, it's pretty crude. But 
it worked. I did fine tune it a little bit after the glue had dried. So I gave up trying to get in there with a knife and I found this Dremel at a thrift store years ago and it works like a charm for this kind of stuff. So I just had this big kind of like a burr grinding bit and that just zipped right through that that uh, cream colored styrofoam like nothing. This was a this was a game changer to get that carved out. So now I'm adding some, again, remember I was saying I was gonna use paper clay for that and then I thought, why would I bother? In hindsight, I would have done a lot more um, kind of build up right in the center, like right between his eyes, and I didn't. So I end up having to go back later and do it again. Like I'm, I put this stuff on there and then I'm basically just cutting it all off. I don't know. Sometimes I do weird stuff. I'm kind of giving him more shape. I'm filling in the spot. I basically should have just used another thin piece of styrofoam on the top and carved that right out, but this ended up working. I made it work. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of dry fit this and see what it's going to look like all together. So I'm using, um, these are just dowels that I bought at a dollar store and I'm just poking them in there and then I'm going to just put, well this one I had to sharpen because of that dang blue styrofoam on the bottom. There was no way I was going to push this dowel in there. So I just grabbed a pencil sharpener and put a point on it and then jabbed that in there. It was still tough. That blue styrofoam was just not cooperating. I think I had some other holes in there and then I had to mark which ones were actually the right holes. I did this whole process originally just with toothpicks to make like little holes. So it was easier for me to line everything up. So keep in mind, this is just my test. I want to see how this is going to look all together. And this was the way my brain came up with how to get this horn attached to the skull without putting it there permanently. Look at that, fits like a glove. Perfect. And then the same thing on the other side. You could see my little toothpicks to line it up, get everything in the right spot. And then I just swap those out for the bigger dowels. I had to sharpen that one again. Perfect. There we go. Now we're going to see what it looks like in its spot. So I just have a little temporary hook up there, one of those um, 3M kind of, I forget what they're called. But this thing doesn't weigh anything, like it's styrofoam, it, it, it doesn't even weigh a half a pound. I like it. So now this baby is ready for paper mache. So I'm going to coat the whole thing in a couple layers of paper mache and then it will get some paint and the fun finishing parts. Yay! So here I am taping this to give it some extra stability on these joints. The wooden dowels that I had put in before, I've gone back, I've didn't get that part recorded, but I went in and I glued those dowels in 
both sides and now I'm taping it just to give it that extra stability. Once all of the paper mache is on here, this thing is going to be super strong. That paper mache, um, you put a few coats on and it's, it's just rock hard. So this tape is just, it makes me feel a little bit better that it's going to now be able to withstand me moving it all around as I'm applying the paper mache on here. It's just my little security blanket. Okay, now here we are at the paper mache stage. So the recipe for the paper mache paste itself I got from Roy Cycled Treasures. I'm going to put a link to her paper mache course in the description so you can go take that course to get all kinds of tips and tricks on doing paper mache. The recipe for the paste itself is also Royce's with one addition. So the base recipe is one cup of flour, one cup of hot water, and quarter cup of wood glue. You mix that all together. I add an extra quarter cup of liquid starch. So just three teaspoons of cornstarch in a cup of water and boil it till it's thick. I find the addition of the cornstarch just adds a ton of extra strength. And when you're doing a project like this that's so big, um, that extra strength from the cornstarch just, it just gives you that added security and comfort knowing that your piece isn't going to fall apart. So I highly recommend the cornstarch in your paper mache paste. It makes, makes a huge difference. I'll post the recipe down in the description as well. So this is just the first coat going on. I do, is it two or three coats? I think it was three coats that I put, two for sure, but I think it was three coats that I put on here. And I'm just taking, this is just brown craft paper. It's actually, um, I buy this paper on big huge rolls from Uline. If I remember correctly, it's a 25 pound craft paper. So I'm just getting it in every little nook and cranny and I'm wearing the gloves just because it's messy. It's super messy. And the brushes that I'm using to apply it actually are your normal Walmart chip brushes. And I've actually cut about a half an inch off the length of the bristles so they're more stable and a little bit more sturdy. Because these chip brushes are so cheap and wispy but they work perfect for this. And I even wash them out and just, they're my paper mache brushes. I, I've got two sizes and I really like them. You wanna make sure you get everything covered. You do two or three coats and it's gonna seal it all in. You can't even tell now that there's styrofoam under there. Couple more coats and we're good to go. Okay, so here it is. This has had a few coats on it now. And it's pretty smooth, but I want it to be a little bit smoother. So I decided I'm going to, because these horns need to be smooth. Um, I don't want that paper, those paper lines from the paper mache to be visible on the horns at all. So this is just drywall compound. And I'm just going to smooth it over the horns at this point to, to get them smooth. It was the only thing that I could come up with to achieve this. And this is where, like you can kind of see there's a kind of a lump or a dip right there. This is where my, my um, sad carving skills came back to kind of bite me when, um, 
when I was applying this and trying to get those horns to be smooth. So if you're going to do a project like this, make sure that you get your carving on point because otherwise you're just creating more work for yourself down the line. First coat is on and now ready to sand. So I'm sanding it as smooth as I can get it. I will be putting another coat on here just to fill in some extra little divots and inconsistencies in how I want them to look. But luckily drywall compound sounds, sands really easily and my only thing is just wear a mask and do this. Don't do this in your house. Um, I was doing it in my garage and that was bad enough. It's attached to the house so no matter what, you end up with drywall dust everywhere. That stuff is crazy. I had added some spray foam to this just to build it up easier. I couldn't do this much of a build up with the drywall compound because it just cracks. It's not made for super thick stuff like that. So now I'm just going to try to carve this back into some sort of shape. Be careful when you're doing this that you don't you don't want to cut yourself. So always be aware of where your other hand is. So don't put your hand here and pull back give yourself a little bit of room Okay, so this has a much better profile now. I've got it carved a little bit more towards the shaping that I wanted. Okay, so now I'm just gonna clean up all my bitties here and I'm gonna come in with another layer of the drywall compound to just finish this off and to smooth it out. Okay, so I'm using this DAP um, joint compound. These I just got at Walmart. I think they're about $7 a tub. And they're good because they're small tubs. So you actually have the opportunity to use it before it starts going all weird on you. We're gonna let that dry completely at least 24 hours and then I'll come back with that second coat and we'll go from there. Okay so this morning I went ahead and I applied my second and hopefully final coat of drywall compound and then because it is drying super super slow I decided to put a fan on it and then that was about two hours ago. So I came back in to check it and I'm going to want to show you, I'm going to zoom in and see, see all those cracks. I think that's just adding awesome accidental character. So I'm going to go ahead while it's kind of partially dry and I'm going to put some more drywall compound 
and I just used a putty knife to put this stuff on. By the way, I totally screwed up this morning and I didn't record any of it. I thought I did, but I didn't. So I'm just gonna go with my little plastic putty knife here and I'm just going to apply more. Just a, not a super thick layer, but enough that it will crack because I like the texture that it's giving me. And I can always sand off any crazy high points or whatever that I end up with, but still maintain those cracks. Cause I think it's just giving it really cool character. So I'm trying to visualize what you're going to see when it's up hanging on the hanging on the wall. Longhorn Mount is finally at the paint shop. Um, I'm gonna start with the horns because I know what I want for the horns. So I went online and I found this picture of a European mount. Well, they've, they've painted it, but it's an actual skull with actual horns. And if you can see all the colors that are on those horns, that's what I had visioned for what I wanted mine to look like. So they can be so many variations of colors. Usually they're darker at the tips and then they kind of lighten out as it gets closer to the skull. So that's what my plan is to kind of um, imitate that natural look. And they're not all the same. I mean, they're animals. They have all kinds of different stuff. So. I can do whatever I want on this guy and I like the way that these look. So that's my inspiration photo. So I'm going to start here on the tip. I have my picture handy so I can refer to that. And I've got a bunch of the IOD, IOD, not IOD, DIY paint colors out. So this one is weathered wood. And then I've got both Little Black Dress and Old School. So I have both of those. I have Sandy Blonde and Summer Crush because there are some kind of coppery tones. So I thought Summer Crush would be a really nice one. And of course I've got um, Crinoline and White Swan. So I'm just going to, they're really dark on the, 
I'm, this is just gonna be a base coat. I'll focus more on the actual finished look once I get this base on, but I just need to need to get a base. So this is, again with my picture, because I really like how these look. So I'm gonna go with this little bit of, they've got kind of this coppery, coppery tip and then the dark almost black and then it goes into almost like a copper and then a sandy color and it's kind of all just mixed in there. So I'm gonna go with that. That is my plan. So I need a little bit of the Summer Crush right off the hop. And then over the, the actual piece, when it's finished, I will be adding some copper. So this has been primed. I primed it before I brought it out here. So I am just going to start applying this paint. When you have your paint down in something like this, it's always a good idea to spritz it with water once in a while, just to keep it from drying out. I'm blending it a little bit as I'm going. I'm not super concerned. I'm just getting the rough idea on how I want things to, to look. I'm not, I'm not going for precision here at this step as you can probably tell Okay, so I'm gonna reset this up. I will probably be back at this tomorrow. I'm gonna let this sit. I've got to, I've got chores to do. I got critters to feed at home. So I'll see you tomorrow. I thought that I would stop and try to explain a little bit of my process and how this is working for me. As I was applying it with the brush, it was just too smooth, too, too perfect of a blend, and I wasn't liking that. So then I got the idea of to just put the paint on with my silicone paint blades. So these are from Iron Orchid Designs. They've been out for quite a while now. And every once in a while, I remember them and I pull them out to use them. And I really like them because they're just, oops, let me just wipe this one off here a little bit. So they're totally made out of silicone and they're, they're a little bit flexible, but not super flimsy. They've got some, some substance to them. 
And there's just these two sizes. I'm using the little one. I probably use the little one most, but. And all I'm doing is grabbing my paint colors and this is all DIY paint. And the reason I'm also using DIY paint versus something like Fusion is because I want that reactivation ability. I wanna be able to um, either wipe this back to the previous layers with water or easily with, with sandpaper or something like that. I never know exactly how I'm going to accomplish the look that I want to accomplish until I'm actually doing it. So it's really hard for me to conjure up a plan and just implement that plan and get it out. Um, I don't work that way. My, my brain to, to hands, it doesn't work that way. So I just kind of figure it out as I go. So that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm just taking this paint and I'm, you can see it looks like a hot mess, but I'm just applying color and I'm trying to, like I'm not going to exactly replicate every single light spot, dark spot, um, copper, all of that. I'm not gonna exactly replicate that. I'm just using this as a guide. Sometimes it helps to have that visual in front of you. So that's what I'm doing. I am just applying color. It's going on fairly thick in spots and not so thick in other spots because I'm using the silicone paint blade. Um, you could use whatever you have on hand. You can use uh, um, those little artist spatulas. I would suggest the plastic ones from the dollar store. They're plastic and they're super bendy. Those work really, really well um, because you have that little bit of give. You want something that's going to have a little bit of give, I, I think, anyways. Okay, so I'm just going to continue just applying paint and keeping in mind that these are all going to be wiped back or sanded. I'm probably gonna sand, even though it's incredibly messy, um, to let some of these other colors then peek through more how I want them to look because like I said, the blending with the brush, it just wasn't working for me. Now I'm gonna start just sanding this back a bit. And I've just dug out a bunch of old sanding blocks. And I just wanna get a kind of an idea on what this is gonna look like. Okay. So I just have a bucket with some water. You can already see how it is giving me more of an organic look versus trying to blend it with my brush. So I'm just wiping through, see what colors I have underneath. And just kind of carefully I don't want to take off too much, go through a color that I like, where I like it. But this looks a lot more like this now. Like see how that is very kind of modeled, kind of chunky, and I'm getting a way closer replication of that here now. And all that was is just slapping paint off with that silicone blade and now just going through and softening that a little bit with water. And also once you seal this, it's going to be so much bolder. I'm liking how this is turning out now. So 
Sometimes when I start a project, I really start questioning my sanity on how I think I was possibly able to achieve the finish I want. But this is working in my favor. Okay, I'm going to show you. I'm going to try not to wiggle too much. But So this is what they look like. This is after I just spatula it on the paint using that silicone paint blade. And you can see it's just kind of, I went with the colors that I wanted in the areas that I wanted, but I really layered it. So it's kind of all, it's a mess. It really does look like a mess. And now this is the other side and I've just wiped it back a little bit. But you can see how that looks a little bit more organic. That's just the word that I have in my head that seems to be able to describe it. So I'm just going to continue wiping this back until it looks how I want it to look. And keep in mind again that this looks a lot um, bolder. The colors pop a lot more once it's sealed. So I've gone ahead and I have applied a second kind of thick chunky coat with my paint blade closer to this. So if you can kind of, it's getting there. But now I'm going to let that dry really well and I'm going to work on the skull itself. So I'm going to take it off its contraption and just set it on the table and we're going to start working on the skull. Okay, so now we are going to be applying molds. Well, I am going to be applying molds. I decided, I'm going to put it so you can see him. I decided that I was going to um, apply some molds to give it a little bit of kind of a feminine flair. I know that sounds weird, but um, I struggled with what to do with this part of, of the skull. Put, we'll put it that way. Um, I do love this nice little crackle that I got on here all by accident. Um, that was from, if you remember, putting the drywall paste on super thick and then putting a fan on it to dry it fast. And it just kind of, it kind of, um, it cracked. Words escape me big time. So, and this one's called Dainty Flourishes. So this one came out probably last spring, I think. I don't remember now. But this one has the same idea but they're a little bit thinner and more delicate, more dainty. And there's a whole bunch in this one. So I'm probably gonna be using, like I love this. Like that one would be so cool, kind of right in the middle here. I don't know which way, probably that way. But anyways, oh, I'm not even showing it to you, this one. Okay, so what am I gonna do? I'm picturing, kind of some scroll work just coming up kind of one side and then going up like this. I don't, I'm not looking for perfect symmetry. I'm not looking to cover the entire skull. I just want to add a little bit of oomph because then once I paint everything, I'm just, I'm just picturing highlighting these high points with some, some copper paint and stuff. And I think it's just going to look awesome. So I'm just going to start making some. We're just going to make some. So I'm going to dust my mold here with cornstarch. 
And I'm pretty liberal with the cornstarch. Just get it all in there. You just don't want to miss any spots. These are fairly deep. The, the molds, the castings are pretty, they'd be pretty deep. So you really want to make sure, and especially because they're so delicate, if you have any spots in there that you don't have cornstarch, um, you're going to struggle to get your casting out. Okay. I'm just going to knock out the excess which there's quite a bit because I was not being cheap on the cornstarch. And then I'm gonna get, just grab some clay. So I'm just going to push the clay into the mold. is actually a little bit drier than I would like for creating these more intricate molds but I'm going to make it work so now this is how I make the molds it's how I've always made the molds it works for me um, I just push it in and then I use this putty knife or this yeah putty knife to really make sure that it's pushed in there and I'm exposing the micro rim so IOD has this wonderful little rim all the way around its molds and it gives you a nice clean line so when you turn it over and you pop out that mold, that casting, it's just, it's perfect. It looks so good. So I'm just gonna make some here and I'm gonna kinda play with placement. I just wanted to show you where it's at a kind of a close-up so I started at the bottom and just worked my way up with the molds all the way up so once I finish with the horns I might want to add a little bit more to just kind of spill out onto this horn but I don't want to do that until I've um, finished with that Okay, so I've wiped back the horns. I like how the color is kind of distributed on there now. And I'm going to go over it with a coat of Big Top just to seal it all in. Um, sometimes sealing, even when you think you might be adding more layers, sealing kind of gives you that buffer. So, that's what I'm gonna do. And I'm just gonna sponge on Big Top. So I've just got a, I've just got a chunk of uh, just a normal kitchen dollar store sponge. So I'm just gonna use the sponge and I'm going to just wipe, wipe it on here. And that way I'm just getting a thin, I'm just getting a thin coat and I'm not having to worry about a brush and being all upside down on the base. Just get a good coat over the paint on these horns. I 
got everywhere. So that is good. I'm going to let that dry and then we're going to work on painting the skull itself. Okay, so now I'm going to, I've put all these molds on the other day. They're completely dry now. And now I want to kind of base coat this. I'm going to use fusion paint because of the built-in top coat because this is a base and I don't want it to I don't want it to go anywhere once I've got it on there. So this is parchment, fusion's parchment, and I'm just using this is an old really old um uh like a French tip brush. And I'm going to use it because it's got this more of a point and it's soft. So I want to be able to get the paint worked into all these little areas in the detail around the molds that I put on there. I painted this and then I thought it looked kind of naked on this side. It wasn't balanced right. I, I wanted it to kind of come up this side more, but then when I put it, um, when I stepped back to look at it, it looked crooked versus how I wanted it to look. So I added a couple um, molds. And I just quickly poured them using resin and just glued them on. So this one, this one, this one, and this one are new additions. And it kind of makes it look a little bit more balanced. So I'm going to go with that. But now I want to do a little bit of kind of an antique look on here. I don't want it to stay crisp white like this. So I've kind of been going back and forth in my head on how I wanted to do that. And I think I'm just going to use dark and decrepit. And I'm going to initially try it full strength, I think. And if I need to, I will water it down a bit. It's an experiment. I'm going to give it a go. Okay, so a little bit of dark and decrepit because I know I like the brown. And I'm going to go ahead. This is always the hard part because I never know if I'm going to like it. I can always paint over it. So I'm just going to smush it on here and try to get it in right into the detail. And then give it a spritz. That's the part that's kind of worrying me on how that's going to work out. But I think that's going to work. We can always paint over it, right? I think I like how this looks. 
I wanted to put a little bit of copper. So this is DIY Paints uh, Pennies from Heaven. This is also a patina. So the same kind of formula as the dark and decrepit that I was using to do this. So this also has a built-in top coat. And I just want to see what that's going to look like on to kind of highlight here. I can always paint over that if I don't like it. Okay, well, I think that's, that's as much as I'm going to get done on this today. I'm going to have to let it sit for a bit. All right, we'll let this be for a bit. Okay, I just wanted to give you guys kind of an overall visual of where it's at right now because it's really hard. It's impossible for me to judge something. I need to be able to step back and look at it kind of as a whole. So I will definitely, I think, be adding some more paint um, to, let me just, in these areas, I want to, I want to, to me it still looks flat. The color of the skull itself looks flat, but I don't want this one to be flat. I want it to have depth and variation and interest and to me, I just think it's not, it's not right yet. And like I was saying earlier, as much as I love the dark and decrepit, it's a little bit too um, gray of a, of a brown in this, in this case. I want it to tie in a little bit better to the, to the color that's up here. So, and then of course this transit, I'm not even 100% sure if I'm done with these horns yet. Um, but this gives you the overall look. I definitely am going to be changing this up a little bit, but I'm liking it so far. It's definitely making progress and it's heading in the right direction. So adding the copper to the molds um, helped me visualize what I was looking at. That just highlighted them all and it gave it just a little bit of that kind of Western flair. So I think it's all going to work out really well. Yeah, we're just going to let this sit for, well, it's going to be a couple days, but we'll be back. I'm back. It's been a couple days and we've let everything just kind of stew and I'm all ready to go now for this next part where I had, if you remember, I mentioned before that I want to add some of the layered chocolate, which is this nice, rich, warm brown. I know it's hard to see in here, but anyways, it's the same, same brown I used on the horns. So, so remember I said this is kind of flat looking and I didn't like that. So I have my layered chocolate and I wasn't sure how I was going to do this part. I was originally going to use a spray bottle to apply this like just watered down paint and just spritz it on here. And then I thought, no, that's not really going to work. So this is really good and dry. <clears throat> These extra molds that I put on here are, everything's attached really well now. So I'm going to spritz this first, just to give, so the paint doesn't just attach right away. I want to give it a little bit of a buffer. So I got it pretty, pretty wet. And then I'm just going to take paint on my brush and I'm just going to start dabbing it on here. And it's, it's okay that I'm painting over everything that I've done already. That's, that's fine. Now I'm going to give it some more water for it to move. I'm just wanting to add the warmth of this layered chocolate color because it's a nice rich warm brown and when you're working with the paint versus the dark and decrepit you have way more open time well not necessarily open open time because the paint does dry very very fast but you can always reactivate it whereas with the dark and decrepit you don't have that option it doesn't 
reactivate nicely. So another reason why I use baby wipes all the time, it might seem kind of wasteful, but they have no texture. And I found that if I use like a microfiber cloth, for example, or a t-shirt, like an old t-shirt, it transfers a texture when you're doing this, like a pattern. And I don't like the pattern. So these have really no texture to them. Nothing that will apl that applies when I do this technique anyways. So I like that. That's why I use them. It's why I buy them at Costco, buy the big box, because I go through quite a bit when I'm really going on painting or stuff like this. Okay, I'm liking that a little bit more. I wanna add some shading in that eye socket. Okay, I'm gonna give this a quick dry. Okay, I wanna show you what this looks like when you can step back and look at it. It's very flat and dull looking because of the style of paint. So one, once it's sealed, it's gonna look a lot warmer. And I think with some more copper and just a tiny hint of turquoise here and there because copper and turquoise are, they just go like peanut butter and jelly. They just go together. So I have my copper patina and this is old 57. So this is, these are both DIY paint products. This is a paint, this is a patina. So this has a built-in top coat, this does not. Um, I just have it in this smaller bottle, same reason. It's just, I find it a lot easier to work with. So I just want to use a tiny wee bit of this in random little spots. I'm gonna seal it first, guys. So, where's my big top? Sealing it first is going to help give me that buffer layer. Okay, so I'm going to dry this. So I forgot about my summer crush that I wanted too. And this is giving me even more warmth in that brown, in those tones, obviously that orange color gives you even more. I need a smaller brush so I can get in some of these little details. Okay, so see how things go in a completely different direction? Because I had a whole different plan in my head on how I was going to accomplish the look that I wanted to. And until I picked up this little brush, it wasn't happening. Um, I was trying what I thought was going to work, but it was not, it just wasn't working. And now all of a sudden, it feels like it's, it's coming together all because of a tiny paintbrush, which I don't use very often on stuff like this. Let's keep going here. So you see when I wet it, how that color totally changes and it gives me a way better idea on how this is going to look. 
So it's a constant back and forth of paint and water and different colors and just getting it all everywhere you want it to be. And I'm just going to keep going until I like what I'm looking at. All right, I'm nervous about the turquoise because I really don't want that to get too crazy. Sometimes just having things in these little bottles like this just really helps on your application. Come on. See how this is giving it oop, just a slight and that spritz of water helps it move. And that's kind of exactly the look I am going for. I'm just going to give it a light mist overall so I can just go ahead. The water makes this paint kind of travel erratically kind of it just wants to find the path of least resistance it wants to just go and because I've got it on this angle it's naturally flowing kind of into those molds which is perfect for me see how this is making this kind of doing its own little thing following the cracks and stuff that's my favorite kind of look. I love that. And sometimes if it seems to be kind of pooling weird or whatever, just give it a spritz and it moves it, helps it along. But this is probably one of my favorite techniques because it gives me this look that I love. And it's just being patient with how, how the paint will flow. And just using a little bit and water. Using the water really helps. I had a customer come into the store, so I had to um, step away for a bit. So this has had time to dry. So I wanna show you what that looks like. And I'm going to, I think, cause it's on a white background and it won't be where it's going in the house. So I need to, I'm going to lighten this up a little bit more here, I think, just kind of just kind of blend that out to make it a little bit lighter. And I wanna add, you can see how this kind of orange part right here, I wanna add a little bit more of that to kind of balance things out. So a little bit more orange down here, I think, and maybe right in here. Cause I think with the copper on there, it's going to I'm going to dry brush that copper on top and I think it's going to look really good and that might be enough actually. Remember I was saying there's that. You could really see that orange up here. So I'm going to want to I'm just going to add a little bit, I think right in here of some orange. So now I'm going to seal this and I'm going to use a spray sealer to get all this detail sealed up so that it's easier to do some dry brushing on, on the top without 
reactivating this all of this work that I've done on here. I don't want any of that turquoise to change or to move. I like it exactly how it is. So this is what I'm going to use. So it's Rust-Oleum and it's just the clear matte. Uh, you can get this in satin or gloss or anything else. I'm using the matte here because I don't want this to be shiny. Now see that instant change in the depth of the color? Really, really liking this. So when this dries, I'm then going to go over these high points with the copper. And I was going to just like dab it on, but I'm gonna dry brush it because I think it gives a little bit more, a softer but more precise application than using my finger. So I'm going to let this dry completely and I will be back with that copper. And then we're going to, we're almost done guys. This has been one heck of a project. So, and I've got my leather to put here. So we're gonna, gonna work on that. Okay, doesn't this look gorgeous? Oh, he looks so good. I love him. So now I wanna put some copper. So I have my copper on my brush and I'm going to wipe it off. A lot of it off. And then I'm just going to lightly brush my brush over these molds and that little wee bit of copper on my brush is making a really big difference. But see how that has changed how that looks? But always remember that it's easy to add but really hard to take away. So you want to just go with a little wee bit and really light touch when you're dry brushing. I think this is done guys. So I'm just going over with the copper dry brushing on the horns, not over the whole thing. So just on the tip and on this dark where the copper is, the copper, the orange color. I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. Okay, I'm on the home stretch, actually finally on the home stretch. So remember the other day, or maybe I didn't, I don't even know what I've told you guys now and what I haven't, but I have leather as the backsplash in my kitchen everywhere except the cooking center. And this is the leather. I am going to use strips of leather here that match. And I'm gonna go kind of on an angle because that's just what works better on both sides. So that's my plan for that. And I, it's gonna be way, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do that on camera, but that is where I am at now. I really love this. I wanna thank you for your patience. Those of you that have been following me on social media know that this has been a process. I'm really grateful that you stuck it out with me over these past couple months. So I really like how this turned out and I'm excited to get this hanging up in my house and I will show you what that looks like.